Hi there and welcome to Food Shares Plant Family and Crop Rotation Mini Workshop with me, Natalie Bostad, Food Share Toronto's Community Garden Coordinator. Thank you for joining me today. So before we start, I would just like to do um, Food Share's Indigenous Land Acknowledgement. So Food Share acknowledges that the sacred land in which we operate is situated upon the traditional territories of the Wendat, Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. This territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee allied nations to peaceably share and care for the lands around the Great Lakes. Puja recognizes the many nations of indigenous people who presently live on this land, those who have spent time here, and the ancestors who have hunted and gathered on this land known as Turtle Island. Fuchia recognizes and supports the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action, applying both to our work. Foodshare's work is guided by principles of food justice. This includes receiving ongoing guidance from an Indigenous advisory circle on our work and on collaborations with Indigenous groups working towards Indigenous food sovereignty and increasing Indigenous food access. One of the things we also like to do here at Foodshare is, as individuals, think about and reflect on what we are doing on an individual level to support what we're talking about here. So one thing I can say is that as the Community Garden Coordinator and also as the Therapy Garden Coordinator at Foodshare, I work with Indigenous elders uh, to grow some of their traditional medicinal herbs that they use in ceremony on site at CAMH, where I um, tend land there as part of my ongoing work. So what are we going to learn today? So we're going to talk about the different plant families and also the different categories um, that we put plants in when we're thinking about how to do proper crop rotation. And we'll go through what those categories look like. Uh, we're going to talk about how we can tell, how we begin, can begin to tell what plant families um, look like on the surface. So with our eyes, what can we tell about which plants are which? We're going to talk about crop rotation with plant families. Um, and how to do the best possible job of rotating our crops in our garden year to year and also throughout the year. And then we're gonna talk about common pests that attack certain plant families so that you can start to get familiar with both what the diseases look like of different plant families and also the bugs that attack them. Let's get started. So there's three kind of main categories or ways that we often uh, group plants together in order to do proper crop rotation and to do plant ID. So the first one is plant families. So the plants that have similar biology or physiology and they also have similar pests and diseases that like to attack them. So that's one category that we can look at. Number two is uh, the plant needs. So what the needs of that plant are. So plants that grow similarly. So they have a similar impact on the soil. So it's not that they're in the same family necessarily, but they might be doing the same things to the soil. And number three is hot crops versus cold crops. So what temperature plants prefer or temperatures they can grow in. So let's go through these three different categories and we'll see what plants are in them. And again, talking about these categories. This is in a North American context. We're here in Toronto. So this may look different depending on where you are. So here's the common plant families that we see in the garden. So nightshades is a big one. This is uh, one that many people are familiar with. So tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, and eggplant, those are all in the same family um, in the nightshade family. Uh, the next we have the cucumber family or the squash family. Not surprisingly, cucumber, zucchini, squash, and melon, all of those are within that same family um, and have similar characteristics. Brassicas is a big family in the garden. It covers a lot um, of what we do grow here. Um, so things like mustard, kale, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, arugula, cabbage, collard, bok choy, and radish. Um, this is also sometimes referred to as the mustard family. Legumes are next, so this is a special family which we'll talk about in a bit, but all peas and beans are under that um, umbrella of legumes, at least ones that we grow here in North America in our gardens. And the legumes play a special role in, in the garden, which we'll talk about in a bit. Allium family, so onions, garlic, and leeks. Um, that's a pretty straightforward one, you can probably guess. Um, the carrot family um, consists of carrots, celery, parsley, and parsnip. Uh, at least what we grow in our gardens. The beetroot family includes beets, spinach, and Swiss chard. The daisy family, obviously it's relational to daisies, but we don't eat those. So the things in the daisy family we might see in our garden is lettuce, echinacea, sunflower, and marigold. 
And the last category that we might see quite commonly is the mint family. So um, this one's interesting. Many, many things that we grow as herbs in our garden are actually part of the mint family, even though they all may look very different on some level um, and certainly smell and taste different. So mint, lemon balm, sage, rosemary, thyme, basil, and oregano, all of those are in the mint family. So they all have similar characteristics on some level. Isn't that interesting? The next plant category uh, we can look at is their feeding habits. So as opposed to thinking about them all grouped together in the same family, these are all in different families, but they all are doing similar things to the soil. So usually we have three categories. We have our heavy feeders, which are not surprisingly plants that require a lot of energy to produce what they're producing. So things that are producing a large fruit or vegetable, um, are all going to go in that heavy feeder category. Things that are light feeders are going to be mostly things that are not producing a, a solid fruit, um, but more just their leafy greens and potentially some root vegetables as well. And root vegetables are kind of in between a light feeder and a heavy feeder, um, but in general they don't need to take as much from the soil as those heavy feeders do. And then the last category is one of my favorites is, uh, is the giver category. So beans and peas in the legume family actually are giving back to the soil. So obviously they're taking as well, but they are giving back. Um, what they do is they take nitrogen from the air and they fix it into their root system, which is pretty amazing. So what you'll notice when you pull out your peas or your beans is that the root system is going to have all these little um, white or gray kind of circles or nodes on the roots and that is the nitrogen that it is trying to fix into the soil so it's important if you're not going to let your plants just die in the soil naturally uh, your peas and beans rather and you're going to remove them and maybe plant something else you want to try to take the root systems off of the stem and leave those roots in the ground to die so this means you can either cut your stems down with scissors and leave the roots in, or you can pull them all up and then trim them and then leave the roots with that, with those nice nitrogen nodules on the ground and mix in with your soil to get the nice benefit of that nitrogen, which a lot of plants really need and love. And the last category um, that we can think about is very similar in terms of which plants are in it, but it still is a way that people categorize is hot crops versus cold crops. So again, not surprisingly, all of the vegetables that and fruits that produce really large or water heavy or intensive um, vegetables, they're gonna be the hot crops. They're the things that need a lot of sun, they need a lot of water and they need a lot of nutrients in order to grow. And so those are basically the same as what we saw in the last slide, um, but beans are also a part of this. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind as bean is a hot crop. It can stand a little cold, but it doesn't love it. Whereas peas actually are good um, in the colder months. They can withstand a little bit cooler than beans can. So peas are in the cold crops. I think I actually forgot to put it there. So I apologize for that. But cold crops are all leafy greens for the most part and are root crops. So they can stand a little bit colder temperatures. And this is important when we're doing our crop rotation, especially here in North America where we do get cold um, winters and springs. This is gonna help us to know what we can plant when and what our rotation might look like. Um, so now we're gonna go on to how can we tell what family a plant is actually in. So, you know, we can cheat sheet with our list, but when we're out in the garden or when we're looking, um, we're looking around at nature, it'd be nice to have some sense of what am I looking for in order to know what is similar and what are in the same family? So in general, um, usually we can tell by the flowers, which are the, actually the sex organs of that plant. So the flowers of all families are gonna look similar, but we don't always see the flowers of a lot of the plants that we grow because we harvest them before they go into their flowering phase. So for example, a lot of us are not gonna see what a lettuce flower looks like or what a beet flower looks like. So there's some other ways we can tell as well. So again, here's an example of, of what it looks like when we can see the flower growing. So watermelon and cucumber, we can see that those flowers look very similar and the plant is growing in a similar way. It's producing a different kind of fruit, but the growth cycle and the growth pattern is very similar. Uh, we can look at similar leaf shapes, especially in the beginning stages of its life. So those first few leaves that come out um, are really often going to look similar for plants that are in the same family. So this is beet seedlings versus Swiss chard. And in, in general, you know, these leaves look very similar as they grow. 
but they look very similar when they are younger and you could maybe not even tell them apart if you didn't know what you had just planted. And so that's a really important way you can tell is what do they look like when they're small? So pay attention to that. And another way is a similar leaf growth pattern. So in this case, we have mint and basil. Um, and so they're in the same family and you can see their leaf pattern here as they grow one set of leaves on one going one direction and then the next set of leaves is going in the opposite direction okay so you can see that they are both doing that so even though the plants look different um, they are growing in a very similar way and so that's how you can kind of tell that they are potentially in the same family and this is not true for all plants in all plant families but these are some of the ways that we can start to tell and another thing that we can do, especially for the mint family, if we're thinking about is this herb related to the mint family, uh, is the stem. So the shape of the stem or the way that the stem operates, so maybe it has a bunch of fibers on it, a bunch of root systems or nodules are the same. In this case, all things in the mint family have a square stem. And so we can tell right away if something in the mint family by just looking at that square stem shape. And so that's often how I will tell. So there's lots of ways for us to start getting familiar with the plants uh, and what families they belong to. So now let's move on to crop rotation. So why do we do crop rotation and why are we learning about all this stuff? So crop rotation is a hugely important part of gardening, especially organic gardening. Um, and it's a part of how we keep our soil healthy. As well, it's gonna help with pest management and disease management. Now this is a tricky thing to do, crop rotation, if you have just one garden, garden plot or one garden bed that you're working in. Maybe you have a garden plot at a community garden. Um, it's still a good idea to do this for the soil quality and soil maintenance, but unfortunately you may not get the benefit of that pest management and disease management we're talking about because the space that you're operating in is so small that even if you move your tomatoes a few feet over, um, you still may encounter some of the pests that were present on your tomatoes the year before because the space is so, so small. But again, it's still a really good idea to do this at least for um, your soil quality and soil maintenance. So if we look at crop rotation for soil quality, what we're looking to do is making sure that year to year or within the same season, we're not planting um, heavy feeders one right after the other. We wanna let the soil rest for a little bit and get um, some nutrients in it before we do another heavy feeder. So we don't wanna to do tomatoes year after year after year in the same spot um, if we can help it. Uh, similarly, we don't wanna do a tomato and then a watermelon and then a pepper um, and then a zucchini. You know, those are all heavy feeders. We wanna switch up what we're growing in there because that is gonna create a better balance um, and a time of rest for that soil. Super important. Um, again, one of the reasons why um, industrial agriculture is so damaging to soil is that it relies on only growing one kind of crop year after year after year. So not only do they have to um, add a whole bunch of um, supplements to that soil because they're depleting it so much year after year, it doesn't have time to regenerate itself naturally. Um, they also have to put a bunch of pesticides because the pests that attack that plant are gonna be there year after year um, and they're not moving them, they're not rotating them. And so those pests become really um, inbred into that area. So they have to do more and more and more pest management over time, which means that a lot of the food that is grown in those monocrop situations has a lot more pesticides. So in this example, um, you can see that a really nice uh, way that we might plan out, you know, again, either year to year or within the same year, um, our garden bed. So we would start with tomatoes, and then maybe we would do something that gives back to the soil because tomatoes are a heavy feeder. So we might do a bean or we might do a pea. And then um, we give the soil a little bit more of a break with a carrot or a root crop of some kind. And then we come back to the tomato maybe in year four. Right, and so this makes sure that that soil gets some time to rest and get some nutrients put into it. We're obviously always adding compost as well, but it's nice to give it something uh, that it's growing that is giving back to itself like something in the legume family. Another reason we do crop rotation, as I sort of hinted at, is for pest management. So if you can imagine this, every year you've got something growing in your garden and the pests that like to eat that particular plant family are going to find that eventually. Uh, so they'll find your tomatoes or maybe one of them catches on and they 
what they'll do is they'll lay all their eggs either in uh, or around that plant or on that plant, anticipating that the next season that plant is still going to be there and that their babies are going to wake up in springtime and be able to munch down on that exact same plant or that same plant family. And so all those pests are just waiting in the soil for that spring to come and this, the crop they think is going to be there again to be there to munch on. Similarly, if your plant gets a disease in one year, that disease is now present in the soil and diseases impact different families differently, different um, plant families differently. And so if we rotate through plant families in different locations, it means that we don't have to worry so much uh, about whether our plant is going to get a disease right off the bat in the springtime because we know that that disease is dormant in the soil. And so these are the reasons why we want to rotate, both because we want our soil to be good and to be rested and to be well nourished, and we also don't want to have to deal with pests immediately in the springtime attacking our plants. So here's a couple of examples of um, what you don't want to do, what you could do, and what's best to do. So in the first example here, um, we have a tomato to a pepper. So one year we plant a tomato, the next year we plant a pepper, or we plant a tomato and in the same year we want to plant a pepper after that. They're in the same family, so that's not awesome, and they're both heavy feeders. So not only are you risking pest and disease, but you're also depleting the soil. So we don't want to go with that method or we don't want to go with that option. The next thing is a tomato to a watermelon. So this is fulfilling that plant family switch. So we are technically in two different families. However, um, these are both still really heavy feeders. And so it's not, it's not the whole package of how we want to do that crop rotation. Um, whereas at the bottom, we have a tomato into something like a kale or a leafy green. And this is a great rotation because you have a heavy feeder and then you have a light feeder after that. You could also do a pea or a bean, which we often suggest after a heavy feeder, you put a giver in there, um, something that's giving back to the soil. But even if you did this rotation where you're going from not only a heavy feeder to a light feeder, but also two different families all together, that's the best kind of rotation you can get for soil quality and pest management. So here's a couple of examples, um, or here's my suggestions for how I often go about doing my, um, my crop rotations in the same season. So you can, depending on how early you start, how long your season is and what you're planting, you can get three crops per year out of one bed. Um, at least two crops per year is always possible and sometimes it's possible to get three. So spring crops, I would do my light feeders. Um, so you could do root crops, which helps break up the soil in the springtime and gets it nice and ready for your summertime crops. You could do leafy greens um, that are light feeders. They don't mind the cold. Um, or you could start with a pea, and that is giving that nitrogen into that soil right away so that when your summer crops come, um, you've already got something that you know has given back to the soil immediately. And then in the summer, that's when all your heavy feeders go in. So those happen in late May through to late July um, to get those crops happening. And then you can put a fall crop in after you pull out your summertime crops, depending on how long your summer crops are growing um, and how long you want them to go and how ambitious you are. Um, but so your fall crops will go in, um, in August through to mid-September. And you can basically do the same things as those spring crops. So your light feeders, your root crops, um, your greens, and again, your peas. And remember that peas and beans are both giving back to the soil, but peas can handle a little bit of the cold, whereas beans cannot. So beans have to be a summer crop. Um, but beans are a great thing to be putting within your, your garden beds in the summer because they are giving back. So now let's go through a couple of the major plant families and we'll talk about some of the pests and diseases that you might see on these. And we don't have time in this mini workshop to go through all of the ways to get rid of these pests and diseases. Unfortunately, we'll do that in another workshop. So the nightshade family, um, they like to get attacked by a lot of different kinds of bugs, but the one that is specific that you may find to the nightshade family is tomato hornworm. So it is a, he is a big boy and he moves very slow though and he actually is quite cute, but uh, it is shocking to see how big this uh, bug is on your plants, but it's fairly easy to remove and there's usually not more than a few of them. Um, but this is one that is specific to the nightshade family. There are a couple of other bugs that I will be talking about that love a lot of things, so just wait on that. 
And then in terms of diseases, the two main diseases that uh, the nightshade family often encounters is blight and powdery mildew. Um, and you'll notice that there, the next category I'm going to talk about also has these two main diseases. So diseases often are specific to a very uh, a plant family, but sometimes a disease does transfer over into different plant families. And so if we look at the cucurbit family, the diseases that affect cucurbits are the same. So the nightshades are more prone to blight and cucurbits are more prone to powdery mildew, but they both can get both. They both can be affected by both. Um, so you just have to look out for that. And for that reason, you may want to try not only to switch up um, not having a nightshade after a nightshade, but also not having a cucurbit after a nightshade or not having a nightshade after a cucurbit, if that makes sense. So the bugs and pests very specific to the cucurbit family are the squash beetle and the cucumber beetle. So these guys are a little bit harder to manage. They like to jump, um, they are a bit quicker, and so you're gonna have a, a harder or more challenging time getting these in control, but as soon as you see them, um, know that these are, that are guys that are gonna mess up your um, squash and pumpkins and all sorts of things in the cucurbit family and you wanna get them out of there as soon as you can. Brassicas also um, have a lot of uh, pests that love to eat them. Sometimes I don't even grow arugula because uh, it's so tender that it really gets munched on often by the flea beetle very specifically. Uh, but cabbage moth and flea beetle are two really main bugs that you'll see loving the brassicas. Um, and so again, there's lots of different ways to do pest management on these, but here, if you see one of these on your, on your beds, you know it's pest management time for your brassicas. And the three main diseases that you may see on your brassicas are black rot, which kind of deforms the leaves. Um, the ring spot, where you've got these little white dots on the leaf structure. And then club root, and club root is really tricky because it's underground. And so you may find the telltale signs of club root are often that your plant looks a bit yellow or it has some yellowing leaves. And this may be a sign of club root. And the only real way to tell is kind of dig it up. Um, you want to get whatever plant looks like it's got club root, you want to get that out of the garden. Um, there's, there's really hard to, to manage it any other way other than just removing it and hope that it does not spread to your other plants underground. Uh, but that is a tricky one. And then here's a couple bugs that really love everything and you may see them on various types of plants. So aphids is a big one. They are not very discriminatory. They love all lots of things. Um, I find these most on my brassicas and my nightshades, but they really do uh, munch on a whole bunch of different kinds of plants. And then they come in different colors too. So they're yellow, they're brown, some of them are black. These ones are a bit orange. And if you, uh, and they live on the undersides of leaves, so sometimes they're hard to find. But if you see a lot of um, ants on your plant, it might be a telltale sign that there is aphids nearby because ants actually farm aphids and they milk them, uh, just like we do cows. And so if you see a lot of ants kind of running up and down the stem of one of your plants, that might be a sign there's aphids there and you should check. There's also the Japanese beetle. It's very beautiful, but it will munch on a whole bunch of different kinds of plants. So you want to get that guy out of there. There are some good beneficial beetles. We don't have time to get into that, um, but they, they look different than this. This one is kind of shiny, metallic, almost has a rainbow sheen to it. Really pretty, but really messing up your garden. Uh, white flies is also um, a very tiny bug that affects a lot of different kinds of plants and oftentimes you'll see this in greenhouses and also indoors um, on house plants. So they attack a lot of different kinds of plants. And then slugs. So slugs, um, they really love lettuce, you can see here. So they do love uh, the lettuce family specifically, but they also love the brassicas. They'll get on a whole bunch of different kinds of things and they move slow, but if there's enough of them, they can really do some damage. So it's good to watch out for. Um, so just thinking about, you know, a lot of people will go out at nighttime with their headlamps and pick the slugs off of their lettuce beds if they have an infestation. So something to keep in mind. So thanks for being with me here today. I hope you learned um, a little thing or two about crop rotation, why we do it. So again, soil quality, pest management, so important. And remembering that we want to rotate not only through plant families, but also thinking about 
heavy givers versus light givers or light heavy feeders versus light feeders. Um, so if you have any questions, you can always uh, check us out at foodshare.net and you can email me. Um, I am at natalie at foodshare.net. I hope you had a great um, time in the session and I will catch you next time.